So burying our head in the sand, focusing on whether this kid can do calculus, whether this child has enough extracurriculars in their back pocket to get into the universities I'm choosing for them to go to, that is the least of your problems. So that's kind of the message I'm trying to get out right now is, yes, that is absolutely what you as a parent should be focusing on is the best you can do for your child. But the best you can do for your child at this point in time, in the year 2019, has to include a focus of our climate action. Welcome to Talatera, a podcast about freelance educators working in natural resource fields and environmental education. Who are these educators? What do they do? Join me and let's find out together. This is your host, Tanya Marion. Today, my guest is Karina D'Souza. Karina is an independent strategist who helps Generation Z, those born between 1996 and 2010, navigate the future of work. While Karina speaks primarily with students, her messaging is directed towards their parents as well. I invited Karina to be a guest because she doesn't talk only about career building. She talks about environmental awareness, too. What is Karina's message to parents? Why does she take an environmental position in her work? What does the future of work look like and how might freelance environmental educators contribute to this future? Let's find out. Well, thank you so much for being here today and for stopping by to chat about your work. You are a strategist, so explain what you do as a strategist and what do you help make happen? Well, first of all, Tanya, thank you so much for inviting me onto your podcast. So as a strategist, strategy is something that found me as opposed to me finding it. It evolved as a part of my career development or career progression, if you like. I enjoy doing statistics. And as such, you very much fall into that whole idea of pattern recognition. And as part of, or through my career stream, I ended up doing strategy for an organization I was working with. And I absolutely fell in love with the idea that everything wasn't, um, I don't know if you remember this song, but when I was a kid growing up, everyone would sing, que sera, sera, what will be, will be. And I kind of grew up with that attitude. It's like, you know, you just take things and you roll with the punches. And when I first got exposed to strategy, it was the first time I realized that people actually can make a choice. It might, it's not predictive. And that's the thing I think that was most enlightening for me. It's, it's not a prescription. It's not a recipe and not a guarantee that something's going to show up the way that you want it to. But at the same time, you actually do have the opportunity to create a plan and then understand that that plan can evolve over time. So that's the bare bones of strategy, the way I enjoy doing it. The second part of your question was, what do I want to do with it? Yes. If I believe, Mm -hmm. if I got you correctly. So about, probably about 2014 or so, I got myself back into doing strategy work. And um, I'd been running a small business and I was exhausted. And when I closed the business down, primarily to focus back on what I thought was the most important thing to me, which was my children who were going through their teen years, I started looking around for how I could, what I would do again. And my mind immediately came back to the things that were within my experience set. So that involved strategy, that involved the pain and suffering I've been going through with no sleep. Um, And having grown up as a technologist, uh, as a programmer, it involved understanding payments, it involved understanding technology. So I actually started a blog about small hacks, if you like, for small business people. And the premise was, if I can save you 15 minutes, that's either 15 minutes you can spend actually having breakfast with your kid, or 15 minutes extra sleep. And either way, I know you're going to be better off in your day for those 15 minutes. So that was the premise. It was nothing major. I'm not looking for, you know, huge wins, 
And I was also very aware that it had to be such a small piece of information that a very busy business person would be able to spend five minutes listening to it. So that took me into a whole area, which was the technologies that impacted finance. And through that, I came into doing the future of money. Just at that time, Bitcoin was coming on the, on the scene, as was Apple Pay. Like that was the year they were launching the Apple Watch. And I was writing about all these developments, tap and pay with your credit card. Like these are things which now, I mean, I can't imagine going to a store and not tapping on, with, you know, for a uh, purchase with my card. But I remember writing about it and quizzing technologists in different banks about it. But where that led me was a very interesting space because I suddenly started seeing how people or, or an industry, the financial services industry, which I'd kind of grown up in and I considered to be incredibly robust and persistent, it was letting go of human beings and replacing them with technology. Now, I came into this entire world because I was part of that technology wave in the 1980s when they actually started using digital to settle trades. And we moved away from pieces of paper to digitized information. So I understood the idea behind actually increasing productivity, but this was so much bigger than that. And where it came home for me was at home. When I came home, I'd be talking to my kids about their career choices, or in, that, in those weeks or those months, they actually subject choices, right? So you're in grade 10, I think you'll call it junior year, and, and you're choosing whether I'm doing biology and physics or whether I'm going to take arts and, you know, and music. And these are actually quite important decisions because it, it shutters down your other choices once you go beyond that. Once you're in that funnel, it changes what your choices are beyond. And I took a step back from my future of money work and I began to realize that there was actually something much bigger going on, which was the whole robotics, AI, uh, trend was actually going to impact my children, the people who were sitting at my dinner table, so immediately. And I thought, wait a second, me, knowing what I know, if I'm not able to advise my own children, what is the point? And there's no point in me going out and talking to all these banks and talking to them about strategy when I'm actually not able to help my own child and sending that, them down a path which is going to be out of fashion within the t you know, by the time they've graduated. Yeah. So that's actually where the whole focus for future for work came for, for me. And, you know, my kids are my kids. They had to listen to me. No, they didn't have to. But, <laughs> <laughs> but what was really funny was um, I found that their friends were listening to me. And, you know, I've always grown up with my kids saying to me, well, mom, you preach too much. And so this came as a revelation that other parents don't... <laughs> <laughs> don't subject their children to the same amount of uh, rhetoric, I guess, that goes on at our dinner table. Uh, but they found it really interesting. But more than that, the conversations my children started having with me about their friends and the impact it had made made me realize that this was a conversation that needed to happen. So that's when I started actually talking about the future of work. The other thing that started happening was I realized that my kids were much more aware of what the technology advances are. Like they were streaming Netflix way before I even knew what Netflix was. So their head is in the latest, greatest. But as parents, I found myself, starting with myself, and a whole bunch of other people sabotaging them, saying, yeah, that's a fad. It's going to pass. Meantime, get your head down, study calculus. And that's where I started seeing a huge disconnect. The kids knew what they needed to do. They were talking, yes, they might have been talking in terms of being a YouTuber and succeeding with music and things like that. But I could see the trend going to where YouTube was such a huge opportunity for education or learning, a learning platform. And they, as parents, we were pushing them away from them, pushing them towards the more traditional roots. And I recognized that the kids were going to go, they, they will look after themselves. I actually have this theory that, you know, everyone lands on their feet. People do what they, they, they react to the opportunities in front of them. But in that space, so we're talking like 2014 onwards, one of the other things that was happening right on the heels of the 2008 crisis was the expense of education. So whereas in my day, if I went to my parents and I said, you know, okay, you know, you want me to do physics, but I've decided I want to do music, the cost was not that significant 
that it impacted them one way or another. Nowadays, with, with education being so expensive, and many parents actually taking out a second mortgage on their homes or dipping into their pension plans in order to help pay their kids' education, it is a choice. You know, it, it, it is a space where parents do feel they have some say or feel the need to have a say. So I was trying to catch that little space because I didn't want kids to feel compelled to do something that their instincts told them was wrong. And at the same time, damage that relationship with their parents, you know, whether it just be a trust relationship or a financial relationship, but that's the space in which I felt I would step in because no one was talking to the parents. Mm -hmm. okay. Everyone's talking to the kids. They're talking to the employers, but they weren't talking to the parents. Yeah. And so how do you help parents distinguish between a fad and what their child, you know, really feels as a, as a calling. Last night in preparation for our conversation, I read an article on the SHRM website. SHRM is, it's an acronym, S-H-R-M, for the Society for Human Resource Management. Okay. And it was written by a member of the Generation Z who works as a consultant for XYZ University. And he is he oversees the Generation Z studies. And he's also still in high school. Well, as of last year, he was still in high school. And he makes the case, you know, the article is 10 things you need to know about Generation Z. And he also, as you've just said, makes very clear case that this generation knows what they want. They are very entrepreneurial. They prefer face-to-face -face conversation. And while they prefer face-to-face -face conversation, it helps. It, it, his recommendation is that if you want to engage with this generation successfully, you need to balance in-person conversation with online conversation. Um, you know, that they want human interaction. They're not just all about gadgets and technology. Uh, they prefer to work independently. They're so diverse that they don't even recognize it themselves anymore. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that diversity is the, is the norm. And they care about honesty and sincerity and competence, and they worry about their future, and they want jobs that provide opportunities to, as he says, contribute, create, lead, and learn. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's a great uh, recap. I was speaking with a professor a couple of months ago, and he said, the generation before talked very much about diversity. This generation talks about inclusion. So they do not see the difference between the person sitting next to them, whether they be a white man of privilege and themselves. It's if you choose not to listen to that person's voice, they are as insulted as if you'd ignored a black woman sitting on the other side of the table. So it wasn't about um, diversity, which has been the discussion that I think all of us have grown up with. They're beyond that. They're like, what's the difference between me and you? You know, so it's a really interesting conversation. Yeah, I think I honestly I Every time I get to interface with this group of kids, I'm blown away. I'm blown away. I mean, I see spectacular opportunities in our future. And my position isn't so much that we are damaging things. It's just let's get out of the way and get, let them get on with fixing things because I really see huge potential. One of the other points you made was about like the digital side. And I remember being six months pregnant with my first child when I was speaking to a group of um, uh, CEOs or was helping create a, a presentation that was the internet is coming. So that is how I actually pegged the date for Gen Z. It's, this is a group of kids who don't have any concept of what it is like to live without the internet. They will never know what it was like. You know, so that before and after conversation that happens in our head is very much like the conversation uh, I, I parallel it to, I am the parent of the first generation of kids who have discovered that there is a printing press, right? Life will never be the same for them as it was for us, right? We are able to make that comparison, but they don't have anything to compare against. And that's, I think that's part of the conversation that's happening right now is we keep saying, oh, you know, in our day or whatever, they can't make that comparison because it didn't exist in their lifetime, in their experience, mm -hmm. lived history. Yeah. And where do you speak with people in this age group? You speak a lot. You're always going somewhere giving a presentation. <laughs> where do you give your presentations? Who is your, 
your audience in terms of adult audience and where do you get to interact with these young adults? I started off concentrating just in my district, in my school district. Uh, so I'm really lucky in that uh, a lot of the schools ask me to come and speak. And traditionally, or I should say up until the earlier part of this year, I would go in and speak into high schools, very often to parents um, and students. I've also started speaking to employers and employer organizations, into career organizations as well, career groups and conferences. But this year, for the first time, I was invited first once and then repeated into a kindergarten through eighth school, so an elementary school in our area. And my first reaction was, are you sure I'm the right person that you intended to invite? And I walked in and, I, and there were parents who had their kids in kindergarten. And I said, what is it that you want to hear from me? And they're like, you know, they obviously were thinking ahead. And first, I was a little bit concerned that my message might be too evolved for them. But then I thought, wait a second, this is exactly what I'm talking about. So as a strategist, one of the things I talk about, I use a, a form of strategy called scenario planning. And I'm always talking, ideally, 15 years in the future. So this is not a conversation about what you're going to do next year or what you're going to do in the next four years. It's what you're going to do 15 years from now. Who are you going to be? And then work backwards to what you need to have in place today in order to become that person in 15 years. And, you know, like I said, I first discovered this whole thing when I was pregnant with my first kid. So as a family, we've always made our decisions that way. And we've used that rhetoric, that conversation, that framework. And I see it now. I see my children who are now young adults making life decisions that way. And, and sometimes I'll look at them and go, that makes no logical sense. And then they sit down and they say, okay, mom. So if this needs to happen, and then they walk me back and I'm like, okay, can't fault your logic, you know, they, because they actually sat down and thought it through. And what might not make sense in the moment makes sense from a decision that they're trying to evolve towards 15 years from now. So that actually worked out really well when I was talking to the parents of kindergartners and, and older. But it also um, was a great conversation because in terms of the future of work, it is not the IQ skills that are going to determine who's going to be successful in this pocket of time. And I'll, I'll come back and describe that in a second but it's the EQ skills. And the EQ skills, when you really boil them down, is everything you ever learned in kindergarten. It's how to be nice to other people, how to, be, how to share toys, how to be empathic when you notice somebody else is crying in a corner and bring them back into the fold. It's all those little skills. And um, it was really funny because about two years ago, I was speaking with someone from Harvard and you know, explaining my work and she goes, why aren't you talking to the parents of a six-year-old? I was like, well, I don't think this is pertinent. She goes, it's the mummy voice. You know, they need to have in their head the mummy voice. So you've got to get to people earlier in the growth process because those are the skills that they're going to need once they get into the workplace. It's that, that self-confidence that you've got this, you know, all those little things are really going to matter right in this pocket of time. I don't know what's going to happen 30 years from now, but I feel that in this moment, we're actually at that stage of transition from one, um, from a very elaborate, well set up industrial era. And I know we've, in many places, it's called the fourth industrial era, but I actually say it's as distinct from the industrial era as the agricultural era was distinct from the industrial era. So we're evolving in a space that, is, that has no framework. And in that space, there are no rules. So when there, are no, there is no roadmap to follow in the new world, I always say, okay, in that spot, I go back to what did generations before us do when they you know, came and populated North America, when they left the countries of their origin and went discovering new places so that they could uh, make a better life for their families. And those are the things that I think are the more important skills right now. It's a survival setup mm -hmm. for the next couple of years. What are parents' reactions to your presentation, regardless of the age of their child? What type of feedback from the parents do you get? And what kind of feedback do you receive from the students themselves? Uh, go in reverse. I think the students are a win-win. Many of them, I think it confirms their 
their instincts. So when I talk to them about things changing radically between what, uh, like trying to apply for university and, you know, being told that you've only got, you've got your choice now 40 specific engineering degrees, as opposed to doing something that's engineering and art, let's say, they, they're now seeing the validation through my conversation and they feel a little more justified in their choices. And they understand that they're going to be in a, you know, learning for a lifetime situation. I think what I'm taking, what I give them is the sense that it's okay not to have it all sorted out at the age of 16. And so those are the conversations which I'm, I really enjoy because they come away with a little more sense of, or a little less sense of distress. And that's primarily why I do this. I'm trying to take the stress out of the, out of the situation because you really have no choice. This is the way life's going to evolve and you've got to roll with it. When I speak with young people, I, I'm very conscious and do not ask, what's your major? I ask, what are your current interests? Or something to that effect. And then usually somewhere in there, I fold in that, you know, you can change your mind, you know, many yeah. times over. <laughs> I don't know what their parents think of that conversation, but, you know. The parents, it's interesting. Uh, it's in my neighborhood, there are a lot of the parents who are at a significant level in their organizations, and many of them do strategy for their organizations. And what I found really interesting is that a lot of parents parent as they were parented, but not as they run their organizations. That to me was very interesting because when you sit down and you're, you know, over, um, you're at a cocktail party or at a rugby game or something like that, and you're having these conversations, like the eyebrows arch, they're like, oh yeah, you know, I just talked about robotics or AI at work and we're doing this at work and we're doing that. And then I'm like, so then why are you sending your son to accounting? It's like, you know, or if you are sending your son to accounting, how are you bringing in that sense of survival once this very repeatable process gets taken over by an AI routine? Like, what conversations have you had with him about how he's going to evolve his career? It's a great, you know, it's a great concept, but have you actually had that conversation? So, and you, that's when the connection happens. So one of the things, I mean, in part, it may be that I'm preaching to the choir because you wouldn't come to my conversation if you didn't have that nagging conversation at the back of your head. Um, but yes, I see that spark happen. I speak, and I always feel like I, I do myself out of a job, but then I'm happy about that because literally it's just a question of that aha moment. I'm just, I'm just bringing a realization to a lot of people. And once they have it, they have it. And um, after that, you know, we'll have other conversations, but that first aha, because so many of us are so busy running our lives, our day-to-day -day lives. And especially if you have kids or, or, you know, parents or someone else you have to work with or even pets, you're working flat out and just having the space to think. That's what I'm giving them. I'm giving them that, that those few minutes of conscious focus, which I'm, and I'm sure they'd have come to the same spot I'm, I know I'm at. I just happen to be the vehicle for the message. When you speak with young adults, do you talk about freelancing and do you know what they think about it? Or maybe I should ask, what assumptions do they make about it? It depends on where, how they were raised. Mm -hmm. So actually, uh, one of the reasons I got into the future of work is I was doing a video and I could not get my hair to respond correctly. Like, you know, it was like just, it was one of those days it was frizzy all over the place. My mom, I'm in Canada and my mother's in the UK, right? And I kept looking at myself going, Mom's going to hate me when she's like, <laughs> and that's, and I ended up having a sentence in my head, which is the voice we hear in our head at the age of 50 is the one that was said to us when we were 15. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. Absolutely. And that is why it is so important as a parent, the way we speak to our children, the way we speak to our young adults echoes, it'll echo way past when we're physically next to them. And that is why it's so important that we choose our words, choose our vocabulary very carefully at this age. So along that thread, if I say to my child, you, are, you will be successful when you are a CEO. And as an individual doing strategy, doing the future of work, 
I recognize that that whole structure is going to collapse. Mm -hmm. There will be very few CEO positions available in the year 2050. But what is my child, who is going to be around 50 that time, going to internalize? You know, unless they're talking it out with a, with a, um, a professional, they will never realize that the word, that, 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 that sense of failure is because they're not a CEO. Because somewhere in their background, someone said to them, you should be a CEO and then you will be successful. So that is the disconnect that I'm trying to work against with parents right mm -hmm. now, is choose your words carefully. So getting back to your sentence, your, your comment about freelancing, one of the conversations I have with parents is recognize that at least 60% of, of the workforce is going to be gig mm -hmm. or freelance within, by 2030. In fact, I'm, the, the stats, depending on where you look and who you listen to, have it more around 80%. In fact, I was quite surprised to hear that today in 2019, or in fact in 2018 when I was listening, 45% of Google and 50, over 50% 50 of Microsoft were already non-full-time employees. Mm -hmm. So that tells you that if organizations which have that, that kind of capitalization are working with a workforce that is very fluid, and so fluid would be another way I'd describe the word of gig, right? People come in as they need it and then they move out and the people who are then needed for the next task flow in. So if you look at that as, as, a, free, as a setup, many of us are going to be freelancers, mm -hmm. all right? And so when I have my conversations with students or with young adults, it's more about expect that this is the way the world is going to be, all right? So now how am I going to survive? How am I... For a start, I have to learn how to look after myself as my own organization. So I often talk to them about me, Inc. Yeah. And that's why I talk about learning how to do strategy. Anything that a corporation would have done, I have to learn to do. I have to learn to keep my books. I have to learn to pay my taxes. I've got to learn how to strategize. I've got to learn how to do customer complaints. All those tasks that departments existed for, I have to do myself. So that's a conversation we have. But the freelancing part is an expectation that not only will you have to do it, you may actually also have a full-time job, but you might also freelance in some other part of your life. So it's an, it's, uh, I think we're going to hear that word much more often if we haven't already. Yeah. You fold into your conversations with people, conversation about natural resources and the changes that our planet is experiencing. And you take a, an environmental position in your work. Why do you do this? Was it a conscious decision or was it a reaction to an event? It was a reaction to an event. But funnily enough, it echoed something that was a very conscious choice. So uh, if we go into a discussion about the future of work, and as I described before, we're at a transition point, an inflection point. So it's very clear that the world that you and I grew up with is no longer going to be that way 30 years from now. And granted, it was kind of evolving that way whilst we were growing up as well. So I know a lot of people talk about it as the future of work. I'd actually argue it's the now of work because there are so many people who are towards the tail end of their careers who are already operating in what we would have termed the future of work, right? A very digital uh, gig economy, second second, third, and fourth career kind of um, lifestyle. So as I talk to parents who are saying, tell me what my child should learn. Now, part of this discussion is also, I'm not a career guidance counselor. That is not what I do. I happen to be a corporate strategist who's realized that the future of work is going to impact the children that I'm sitting around with, including my friend's children and, you know, their, you know, the, my, my kids' friends. And that's how I got myself into this work. So I don't have any other credential that says I'm a career guidance person. And so I find it very challenging when a parent will come up to me and say, but tell me what engineering should my child focus on? Should it be rocket science or should it be nanotechnology? And my answer is, I don't know. Because if you look at the, the cell phone that's in your hand, over the lifetime of kindergarten through grade 12, that little piece of equipment has changed our lives so substantially. So 
it, equally so it will change or there will be a technology that might come and impact and influence the trajectory for our kids. So I can't predict what's going to happen. But what I can say is that there are certain problems that will still persist. So my suggestion is to move away from the career ladder or the career descriptors that we had in our generation, which was accountant, doctor, lawyer, and start thinking more in terms of Maslow's hierarchy. What are the functions that will still persist? Like at a point where we have no roadmap in front of us, we still know we need air, water, safety, you know, those basic functions. So I say, look at those and then create careers within those industries. So that's where it started off as, a, as the original conversation. And I started steering people uh, to have conversations with their kids around the UN sustainability goals. Because if there's something that all of us can work towards, it's a body of knowledge because that's going to persist. So the, the type of action I'm taking, the job I'm doing today might be out of fashion three years from now. But the accumulated knowledge that I've gained around that job hopefully will have evolved and now be able to be used somewhere else. And that's the transition, the transition of using that skill, transferring that knowledge. That is a valid skill. So if at the dinner table, you have a conversation with your child, and very much like you were saying with these kids, is what are you passionate about? What bothers you? What would you where would you like to make a difference? Because 15 years from now, if I can say I made a difference doing such and such, that is that is work. However you get rewarded for that, that is still a valid um, return on effort. So that's where my conversations had been with parents is talk to your kids about the sustainability goals. It, it for start, it helps them develop their body of knowledge, helps them become articulate, helps them create conversations, helps them network, helps them learn how to research. So all the skills that you need, those EQ skills, start getting developed out of those conversations. And they walk away with something they can transfer into whatever they choose to do. So whether you're in, uh, let's take the food industry, I often say you could be a lawyer in the food industry, you can be a chemist, an engineer, and you don't have to, it's not all hairnets and hamburgers, right? Whereas normally when we talk about the food industry, that's where a parent's head goes first. It's like, oh, they're gonna be working behind the counter at McDonald's. Well, first start, there's nothing wrong with that. But there are so many jobs. There's strategy, there's food security, you know, like everything comes in there. And as I was speaking with a friend recently, she was like, if you care about the environment, that's a great industry to work with. Because you can say, how do I create a, a packaging for a fast food industry that is biodegradable? Suddenly you're able to blend two parts of your world together right? It's the industry you're working in. It's the, the technology that you've decided to train in, plus it's your passion. So when you can bring all those things together, then you feel purpose-driven. So that's where it came from. And then I reacted to somebody um, a couple of weeks ago who was quite upset about the state of climate change, and he's making big strides in what he does. And it was a chance comment that he made that had me saying, wait a second, I have a platform, I have a podcast, and if I'm not out there doing my little bit every day, I can't fault anybody else for not taking action. So I started a daily podcast, very short, no more than, I think at most it's been five minutes, but essentially talking about small actions daily. So it's just keeping that presence of mind about what can we do about climate change in particular? What one choice will I make today that will make me feel like I did my part. Now, it's not a big part, but it's a small part. And one of the things I hope will happen is a conversation. A conversation, like the ability for us to share and say, this matters, and then inspire kids. Because I really do think that great next idea is coming from somewhere. It just, it needs that spark. It needs that conversation to happen. Because when people don't realize there's a problem waiting to be fixed, they don't think about it as a problem. So that, that's, uh, that's what drove my focus for this um, series that I'm doing right now called Climate Awareness and Climate Action and just inspiring or hopefully instigating people. How do you fold in this conversation and your blog and all that into your current presentations? 
Well, this is a new thing. So it's only uh -huh. been about a month old. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of the blog, uh, right now it's purely like, you know, the two, three minute segments, but it's, I'm actually writing a couple of pieces that talk about how it impacts. So obviously one of the, uh, it is scary, right? I mean, we all know it is a bigger problem. And the minute you start thinking about it, the more you want to go hide under the covers. And that's exactly what we cannot afford to do. And for me, one of my, one of the people I, who inspired me, actually helped me study for my biology O-levels was David, David Attenborough. And, I, and he'd actually done a presentation a couple of months ago on the BBC talk, talking about essentially, if we do not, we only have a small window of time to focus on climate change in order to make incredible, an incredible difference. If we don't, then a kid who enters kindergarten right now is definitely going to be graduating grade 12 and definitely in the university years into a society that is focused around the climate problem. So burying our head in the sand, focusing on whether this kid can do calculus, whether this child has enough extracurriculars in their back pocket to get into the universities I'm choosing for them to go to, that is the least of your problems. So that's kind of the message I'm trying to get out right now is yes, that is absolutely what you as a parent should be focusing on is the best you can do for your child. But the best you can do for your child at this point in time, in the year 2019, has to include a focus of our climate action. If you're not going to be talking to them about opportunity, what little thing can I do today? How can I, as a human being, be imaginative? I mean, there are things like the, the, um, that little machine that's cleaning up plastic in the ocean, right? These are amazing ideas that came from someone's brain. So there's another person in seven and a half billion people out there who's got an equally fantastic idea. And so it's, it's allowing the space for those ideas to flourish because we need a lot of those tiny little ideas to evolve so that we can actually remedy the problem. But should we not remedy the problem? I, as a parent, am also obliged to talk to my children about, okay, so what happens when there is not enough water to have a three and a half hour long shower, right? It's like the things that our children are growing up with today, which they take for granted, as are actually came about. I mean, I grew up for a while in India and we had bucket baths. You filled a bucket with warm water and that is the amount of water you had for your shower. So having a shower is a luxury. Being able to stand under running water is a luxury. Having clean water coming out of a tap that you do not have to boil and cool in order to drink is a luxury. But they see most of Northern America, most of Europe see these as utilities, but it isn't for a lot of the world. And there is a chance that given the way that we're treating these utilities, these precious resources, that our children and our grandchildren are going to have to figure out how to survive and go back to the way that I grew up, right? So those are conversations I think that we need to start having because otherwise we're not setting them, up, setting them up to survive in what comes after. So I see it as being, you know, I, I talk about Tilt the Future is the name of my, my um, podcast. It is a seesaw. You need to be talking both sides of that seesaw. You need to be talking about opportunity. But you also need to be talking about, okay, what happens if things are not going well? What are you going to do? Because in the end, it's all about survival. Survival in good times, survival in slightly discouraging times my audience the people who i oh, work with are independent educators who work within their communities i assert that they are uniquely positioned to create change in their communities and they work not only in museums and nature centers and places like that but they work deep within their communities in all sorts of venues how might uh, freelance environmental educators contribute to the future of work or contribute to your message as they work with community members, with the public, what would you ask of these independent educators as they move through their communities? What would you ask them to be mindful of in their own work? For a start, I, I want to say thank you to them because I believe that it's people like them who inspire. So, the first ask I would have is to keep up that energy to continue to inspire other people. And I'm sure that's part of what drives them, but also to communicate that passion. 
because it's the inspiration. It's, it's that, that little spark, the, um, you know, you've got to meet people. People will respond to what they're looking for. You can't force someone who's very, very rules driven, very engineering driven to love to draw unless they're inspired to want to draw, right. Or to nurture a, a, a bird that's fallen. So it's got to come from that person, but actually trying to seek where that relationship is, trying to find out the person's instincts and respond to that. I think that's a good thing, but I think the inspiration is the biggest thing because as they communicate their love for nature, the persistence of nature, that's something that I think is that all of us, no matter our age can continue to communicate to young people in a very renewable world. When you think about it, something that does bother me is that the world that we're growing up right now, there are very few things you cannot return. So they've grown up in a very disposable world. And friendships, relationships, those are things that persist time over time. So very often when I talk to my children, we'll talk about seasons, we'll talk about days, we'll talk about the repeatability, the patterns in nature. Because that is what gives you that sense of, okay, I'm grounded. And if there's some component of that 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 a freelance educator can include, I think those are valuable conversations to have in their, as, as they go about their work. Because no matter what part of what trade someone takes on, they can draw on that. What's next for you? What does your next one year, five year, 15 years look like for you? Um. It's funny, this world that has uh, come upon me, like this whole future of work. In fact, when I started doing it, I kept saying to myself, okay, this is probably going to be a three-year thing because by the time I turn around, everyone will have caught up and it's getting to that stage. So um, I think I'll start looking for the next trend. And it, right now it does look at the, like it's the intersection of sustainability, climate change, climate awareness, probably feed myself into that space right now. I believe that we're at such an inflection point that society is going to evolve substantially. And, you know, talking about parenting and things like that, I would love to see a world where we take all the advantages of all the women's livers out there who have done the hard work that I and my children have, have taken advantage of, but also return to a space where we focus on the, the zero to five year because I think there is so much that happens in terms of confidence that comes from how we are nurtured from zero to five. Not only do we develop all those EQ skills, but that sense of self that develops when you, when you know you are loved, when you know you can go out there and fail and still come home and there are open arms for you. Nothing can replace that. So I'd like us to evolve into a space where we are able to reward the people who can take the time to nurture other, their kids and other people's kids. I'm not saying it's one, you know, but I think we have to focus on the zero through five at the same time as figuring out how we're going to work in the gig economy. Um, and I really would like to see a society where we respect people regardless of how they get paid but respect them for the effort they put out there. So your value is not judged by your title or your salary, but it's judged by your contribution and your intent. To learn more about Karina and her Tilt to Future podcast, visit the show notes for this episode at Talatera. Dot com. Talatera is a podcast for and about independent educators working in natural resource fields and environmental education. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with friends and colleagues. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is Tanya Marion.